Right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined from Dallas, Texas by Lori Van. How are you doing, Lori? I am doing well, thank you. Yeah, and Laurie's an international speaker, media guest, five-time author, and a highly regarded mental health expert as an authority on non-suicidal self-injury. Injury. She's been on a mission since 2000 to turn the tide on this international epidemic through NSSI support groups and self-injury prevention and intervention programs. Uh, your next two books will be on the topic of perfectionism uh, with plans to develop a training program and of uh, and as a coach for mental health practitioners, you enjoy passing along your 20 years of wisdom to save other counselors, years of frustration and tens of thousands of dollars and missteps. Um, and you can find Glory at uh, Van and Associates, and we'll talk more about that at the end. What we're going to talk about today is stress management and burnout, because, um, Lori, I think everybody has been through... I mean, obviously been through a lot over the last three years. We've, you know, we've had COVID, then we've war, we've economic uh, uh, uncertainty and all of that. And But we live in a culture that's, that celebrates stress and celebrates, um, you know, anxiety, all of that in work. It's almost like a badge of honor. The more stressed we are, the more important we are, the harder we're working. And, and that is something that's not, no one, it's not true, as you can tell us, but it's also not sustainable, is it? So with stress, we were never meant to stay in a sustained state of stress. That short term, our body is designed to do that. It engages all sorts of different organs and the uh, sympathetic nervous system. But long term, it really does destroy us on a physiological level in a cognitive sense, a neurological sense, and also from the neck down sense. So no, stress management is incredibly important. Yeah. So, um, so how how does one go about starting to to number one address stress in yourself, and then the second part of the question is, what do what do employers and businesses need to do to change this attitude? As I said, of of celebrating. St- I mean, we celebrate stress, and then when people get too stressed out, we go, "Whoa, well, what's wrong with them?" <laughs> Yes, indeed. So recognition ourselves, and I do training events for companies on this very topic of how to retain employees, how to decrease burnout in them. Our body gives us signals. It's just too often we ignore them or we play them off of, well, it's not that big of a a deal. And when you start to have changes in your sleep, in your appetite, your eating habits, your energy level, your ability to focus, to concentrate, you're not as productive, motivation is down. Those are all warning signs. And for employers, they need to understand taking care of their staff, their team's mental and physical health actually helps their bottom line. Because if you have a stressed out employee or they're starting to move towards burnout, maybe dealing with anxiety or depression, it does take a toll on the company where you might have more mistakes that are being made. Well, mistakes cost a business money, it costs reputation, time to undo the mistake. And then if you have an employee that goes to short-term disability, well, that's an additional financial cost to the company. So it is very important for companies to start having these discussions and have individuals come in and train everyone from the C-suite down to the person on the factory floor of sorts of how to recognize these signs and what you can actually do about it that really doesn't cost that much money. No, no, absolutely. And obviously, when people are not in a great frame of mind and that and they're not being productive and all of that also can lead to conflict in the workplace and, you know, the breakdown of collaboration and things like that. So to your point, I mean, there's some real um, there's real economic effect, not to mention uh, your culture is going to be impacted, isn't it? Culture, absolutely. And I know that's been a buzzword over the years Mm -hmm. and some people are like, oh, you know, what is that? It's basically the vibe. If you want to use that terminology instead, it's the feeling of what it's like to work there. It's what are the priorities and companies that 
have a quote unquote corporate vibe of it's all about the money and we don't care. And employees are basically expendable and just cannon fodder of sorts. I, they don't have the greatest reputations and with time they will go out of business or they are really costing themselves financially. So one of the stats that's come out in the last few years is what millennials are looking for in a possible job. And as a note, millennials are the largest part of the workforce. They are a significant amount and what they want to see and what they are considering are companies that actually care about their employees' well-being, their overall well-being psychologically and physiologically. That creates a more positive work environment and a positive work environment produces loyalty. It produces more productivity. There are so many things that go with it. So it's important that companies aren't being short-sighted. Yeah, I think that's a really that's a really really good point, as you say, because of the growing amount of millennials, and and let's face it, I mean our 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 generation, and I'm certainly being guilty of this myself. You know, we we almost wanted to feel so important that even when we took vacation, well, we're not really on vacation because we're working, and like the whole place is going to collapse, or I don't want to be seen as really taking too much time off, and these are all kind of attitudes that that I have to change because, as you say, the workforce isn't going to go along with that, is it? No. And I think that's what we saw with the great resignation. And even with the whole quiet quitting piece is that if there were some silver linings that came from the pandemic, it's that people started to realize how important their health was. They started mm -hmm. to realize that maybe their work-life balance was really out of whack and that they had been missing out on time with their family. And that, things had to change. And while companies are having employees come back to work and that's, that's fine. I think the old mindset we had of just grind, 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 sacrifice yourself. I don't think that's going to continue to work anymore. I think that we've had this great awakening that there's more to life than just your job. Yeah, and, and I agree with you. And that's why I think companies have to rethink organizational structure and all of that and how, how they organize themselves. And because let's face it, at the end of the day, if if you can have people re working remotely some of the time or all of the time, then you have a, a greater pool of choice when it comes to talent. You have people who are a little happier because they get to live where they want to, not as in as in what we came up with, where you have to plant yourself as close to the office as a commute is tolerable. And maybe that's in a high cost area. And guess what? Recession comes, you lose your job, and then you're stuck in a high cost area. And not to mention, um, I don't think anybody, I don't think commuting's ever been any good for people's mental health anyway. <laughs> no, no, indeed not. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, so when you when you talk with uh, with companies now, how do you help? You know, especially bridge this maybe the generational divide in a little way because you know we're probably we're at one extreme. You know, where we're ooh, we, we're stressed and we can't switch off, and we're all and then we feel that they're on the other extreme where they just you know they really want a job as a kind of a part time and the rest of the time being on you know doing whatever they do. How do you how do you bridge that understanding on both sides? Well, I think the first part is you have to listen, that mm -hmm. both groups have to listen to one another. I think that there are a lot of assumptions that are made that employees often assume that the, those in the C-suite only care about the dollar and that's it and they're heartless and that mm -hmm. they are somehow these puppet masters and all these other negative connotations. <laughs> and sometimes it's that communication, it's that open transparency of the C-suite saying, this is the reason why we do the things that we do. Give them a peek behind the curtain because employees, I think, are more willing to maybe go along with something if they can understand the reason. It, same thing in parenting. When a parent mm. says, because I said so, that doesn't go over so well. <laughs> and then for the those that are, are in the management position, I encourage them to go listen to, but what are your employees' concerns? Have you thought about some of these options that they're throwing out there? Can you find some compromise? So 
we're always much better when we're trying to work together and we're listening to one another because that's how change happens. That's how you come up with new ideas. That's how you innovate. So I think that's one of the big first steps. And with that, you can even just throw out some surveys, but they need to be anonymous surveys because there are a lot of employees that really have fear of retaliation if their name is on that piece of paper and they're giving some kind of criticism to how things are being done. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I know I, I agree with you. And I think part of it is that, uh, as you said, I mean, listening to each other and then, and then being flexible and open to ideas. For instance, we have, a. Uh, we have one employee who is who took off to Thailand for um, two months, can do her job perfectly well from there. Um, the type, type of job she does, uh, she produces the results. Therefore, I mean, why why would it serve us to say no? I mean, you know, so if both if both parties are willing to say, yeah, I'm going to, uh, you know, I'll be available. I'm going to do my work. I'm going to continue and I'm not going to miss a beat. And then you say, OK, well, Thailand, whatever. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And I, there are a lot of concerns with the work from home part and some of them absolutely panned Mm -hmm. out and some of them didn't. So what we did see early on is that because you couldn't do anything else, we were all locked down and there wasn't, there weren't sports or activities and whatnot, that employees were actually working more hours in the work Mm -hmm. from home setting because they had nothing else to do. So employers greatly benefited from that. Now, we don't have that situation. And as things loosened up, the employees that were going to goof off and take advantage of the work from home to goof off or even double dip doing two jobs at once, well, that's good information for an employer to have because those are the ones you need to kick to the curb anyway. That Mm -hmm. if they're not a good employee and they can't be trusted working from home, then they probably can't be trusted working in the office either. Yeah, no, I think that's the big that's the biggest myth, I think, is, you know, it feels good to walk around the office and see all these heads down, you know, beavering away. Um, but you don't really know what they're doing. And, uh, you know, if somebody's going to goof off, they're going to goof off regardless. I mean, people are pretty creative, uh, pretty creative nowadays. So on one of the things about uh, if we talk a little bit about burnout, because I think that's, you know, when people reach that stage and they just say, I I feel burnt out. And sometimes it's, it's hard for them to explain what that actually means. And, you know, people go, you're burnt out. Oh, you need a day off or something, you know, rather go, go take a day off. But that's not burnout to me seems like so much more. uh, It's just bigger than that. It it absolutely is because everyone has an off day. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone needs just maybe a recoup here and there. Burnout is a longer period of of needing rest and essentially what you look for is the the motivation is just it's not there the 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 give a you know blank is gone it's Mm -hmm. just you you really don't care it really is similar to depression that sense and depression and burnout run very parallel streams because for depression you get to a numb state where you just don't Mm -hmm. even feel anything you're not happy you're not sad you're not angry you are just numb zippo Mm -hmm. sometimes that can happen with the burnout part the ability to focus concentrate well it's not going to be there because if you're not motivated well it takes motivation to do you know task to concentrate it takes energy and when you get to that burnout stage, it does take a while to recuperate from it because most likely you've been taxing your adrenal glands. You've been in that fight, flight, you know, freeze, fawn state for a prolonged period of time. Your body is literally physically exhausted and the mind and body are interconnected. So if you're physically mm-hmm. exhausted, you're psychologically exhausted too. And that's not just a go sleep it off situation. That's yeah. literally having to rebuild your body. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Absolutely. I, t- I totally agree. And I think that's sometimes, as I said, sometimes people kind of, if you like play down burnout and they think, yeah, a couple of days off, you'll be fine and don't realize the the magnitude of it. And also, as you said, I mean, depression being a, you know, very close relative of, of burnout, um, those people who do, you know, end up with, with mental health issues, it's, it's still hard in the workplace, isn't it? I mean, I always feel like it's, 
if you go if you go in with a broken leg, uh, I keep using this example. You go in a broken leg, nobody turns around to you or behind your back and says, "Hmm, he must have weak bones. There's something up with him." But if you come with, say, and you say, oh, having you know depression or whatever issues, people look at you differently and they start to perceive you as maybe you know weak in some fashion, and and, and that is something that we really really need to address. A hundred percent. And there are some great videos on different social media channels that that go into that point of if someone, you know, hits their head, we wouldn't, mm. you know, put them down if they had a headache and go, well, well that's a weakness in your head. You just you mm. need a thicker skull. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of silliness that but that video very much drives home the point that we have to change the conversation about mental health and really even saying mental health is a misnomer because the brain is an internal organ, just like mm. the heart is. There's no difference. If someone has a stroke, we don't say that's a mental illness. Well, PTSD yeah. is also in the brain. It physiologically changes different parts of the brain. The, the amygdala and hippocampus actually change size when you're exposed to a traumatic event or a prolonged trauma, but yet somehow that's a mental illness, but a stroke that also has an impact on your brain, somehow that's not a mental illness. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. And the bigger thing we know of is the gut binome. So with the gut health, we know that about 80% of serotonin, which we associate with anxiety and depression, that's actually manufactured in your gut, not in your brain. So how you eat has a direct impact on your psychological well-being. And mm -hmm. that's part of my big thing is trying to destigmatize mental health to say, no, it's really all physical health. That's all. Yeah. I mean, it is all the same thing. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I think that, uh, and I think it's been unfortunate, and you know this better than me, obviously, it's been unfortunate in, in, in Western, particularly medicine, where we have separated things. Like I go to the shrink if I'm, got something going on in my head and I have something physical, I go to the doctor and rarely do those two, if ever, do those two ever communicate. We just keep everything, everything separate. And to your point is it's all, it's all interconnected. And, and a lot of the times, as I said, as you'd know better than I would, um, physical ailments actually have a mental, uh, have a mental origin. Yeah, absolutely. Cause what we're seeing is that the, there might be a stress rip here, but it sends off a chain of events from below, the neck and below. And we have started to see some changes in primary doctors where they're giving what's called the ACE, it's Adverse Childhood Experience Exam. Because what we've seen in research is that individuals that had traumas as children and that they weren't addressed, they weren't taken care of in some form or fashion, that they manifest in physiological symptoms throughout teen years and adulthood because it's that prolonged stress. And again, going back to some of that PTSD part of it is that if you are, are always in this hyper aroused state, then that means your adrenal glands are just going. And what we often say in giving Bezel van de Kolk the credit on this is your amygdala is, you know, pre-trauma is like a smoke detector. It's like, hey, everything good okay, we're fine. When you are in trauma, when you are stressed out, it's like a smoke alarm that's constantly going off, which means that mm. your internal organs are in a heightened state of stress. It's all of those stress chemicals are constantly being pumped into your system and it deteriorates the organs of the body. So again, it's the mind and body are interconnected and I'm seeing more primary doctors connect into that. Yeah, no, and, and that's, uh, you know, and that's extremely, extremely timely. Um, one of the other things that uh, that fascinates me as well is that um, when it comes to when, when again, when it comes to mental health, right, or, or anything to do with mental, but we live in a really weird society today where we have, we have these I, these things that are constantly bombarding us and we're seeing and we're seeing with adults um, but but you know the young people coming up like where they're where the anxiety of not 
being on their phone or not checking what the last thing that popped up and being able to focus and concentrate. And yeah, sure, we hear these things about, oh, they can they can do five things at once, you know, and you go, well, can they really, you know? Uh, but you even see adults now who who in a conversation, it's no longer rude for somebody. You're talking to somebody and then ping and they go. Uh, and back to the conversation, you're just going like, OK, so people aren't being present i guess that's what i'm saying and i think that's there is a coming there's going to be a reckoning with that well and that was an interesting thing with covid for a short period of time during lockdowns people got tired of their screens they got mm -hmm. tired of communicating through technology and they longed for that in person interaction we realized just how important it was and it was one of those, I really hope that lasts a long time, but unfortunately it, it disappeared quickly once we went, started to go mm -hmm. back to normal life. We know there's so much research out there about how technology has had a negative impact on us psychologically. Uh, everything from attention span is decreased. Our memory is not what it used to be because we've become too, to rely on technology. You know, previous generations could cite all sorts of phone numbers and addresses and it wasn't a big deal. We don't have that anymore. So our attention is shortened, our memory is shortened. And unfortunately, I think the social graces have sort of disappeared, as you said, that people don't find it rude anymore to say, hey, what's on my phone is more important than my conversation <laughs> with you. And I think that that's absolutely terrible and to go into a restaurant and you see a family and everyone's head is mm -hmm. down there's no quality time and that has its own implications for how we're raising our children oh yeah no for sure for sure especially as you know children almost out of the womb now have a ipad thrust into their hand as the uh, electronic babysitter uh but so it, it is there is a lot of challenges around this because also uh, and and as i said you would know this better than me but all of this stuff that we're feeding into our stuff at some stage it all gets a little bit confused in our head what's reality and what's not reality I do think there is that concern with it. And as we move more and more in technology and whether that's the, the metaverse or all these other variations of altered reality, that some people are struggling with mm -hmm. it. And the more realistic this make-believe world is that we can escape into, the less people might want to deal with the real world and that's pretty dangerous because we were never designed to be isolated mm -hmm. creatures. The pandemic showed us that, that we mm -hmm. do not do well when we are not around other human beings. We need it on a mm -hmm. physiological level, those kind of interactions. And I think it does, when we distort reality, we lose that human factor. That bullying is a really great example of this, um, that people will say things through a screen. They will go, D -d 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 -d. you know, I'll say these horrible things. And there's such a detachment from what they are saying and the impact it's going to have on that individual because they would never have the backbone to actually say those mm -hmm. things in person. Yeah, no, no, 100%. I find the next door app is funny like that because you see people who live in the same areas like having a real go at each other and then you think, I bet you, if you pass them on the street, you know, they'd be head down and rush past you. So, yeah, it does. And I think that is an issue for for the workplace as well, because I think there's an education component as well for people to learn to ha relearn focus, you know, relearn discipline maybe about putting your phone away for a while and, you know, focusing on things. Because I, I, I think that whole scattered you know, being totally scattered all the time. I mean, that's not good for our, our health either. And to be honest, metaverse, I really don't see any reason for that at all. <laughs> all right. Well, listen, any last, any last piece of advice would you have for somebody who maybe is starting to feel the stress levels going up, maybe starting to feel like their motivation's going down, the burnout's coming? There are so many resources out there now, you know, might be slightly biased on this, but, you know, there definitely go seek out a counselor or if you go do the coaching route, 
it check their credentials with of what kind of background experience training uh, do they have in that field? I, I offer both options. It's preferable to do these things in person because it's a totally different vibe when you're in somebody's mm. office versus through a screen. Uh, now, sometimes due to location and availability, it needs to be through Zoom. And you know what? It is what it is, and that's fine. It, it, but still seek out some kind of resources before you are forced to have to go seek it out. Life it can be enjoyable. Uh, so many of the things that we experience as stress are preventable, and we have so much more control over things than what we give ourselves credit for. Mm. Yeah, I re- absolutely. And maybe start with a little gratitude because uh, that often is a good way of like reorienting your thinking. Um, because let's face it, on a daily basis, a lot of the problems we have here are first world problems. And, uh, you know, people in other parts of the world would uh, would die, for, would almost die for those problems. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, thanks again. Um, all of the all, all of the doctor's information will be below this, but please, before we go, tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. Well, I'm the founder of Vannon Associates Coaching, Counseling, and Consulting. We're located in Texas, but for the coaching services, able to do that nationally and internationally. Uh, for the counseling, it has to be within the state of Texas due to licensing. Provide different speaking services for corporations, large and small, on trainings for behavioral health related things, leadership, uh, prevention, a task of burnout prevention. And then uh, has been, as you mentioned, have the Institute for Non-Suicidal Self-Injury, which is an international epidemic in and of mm-hmm. itself and closely related to suicide. Lots of resources on the three websites I have, vanassociates.com, lorivan.com is the speaking and different media interviews, and then the Institute for NSSI covers that part, and you can find me all over social media. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, like I said, all of Laurie's information will be below, so we'll include those links as well. So thanks again, Laurie. Thank you for watching and listening. See you all again soon. 